I want to tell you about a woman named Anna. We'll call her Anna. It's not her real name. It's a woman I met a couple of months ago. Uh, and I'm going to tell you about her story with her permission. Actually, I'm first going to tell you that when this woman came into the church office uh, asking for help, uh, there are many observations or conclusions that I could have made about her based on some simple observation. Uh, we have uh, several people who come in the office on a monthly basis or call the office requesting help. This woman came in, and based on just observation, could have said the following things about her. Could have said that Anna kind of smelled, and you'd be right. Could have said Anna had a deadbeat boyfriend, that she doesn't pay her bills on time, that she has a misbehaved child, and that she's looking for a handout. You could have said all that about her and not been incorrect just by observing. But I sat down and talked to Anna, as I normally do with people who come in, and learned her story. And after learning her story, I want to change some of these things to try to more accurately reflect what I heard. After talking with her, I learned that Anna became homeless after she fled an abusive relationship, and she stayed at the rescue mission for six months because she had nowhere else to go. She is a loving mother who cares deeply for her son. It's just that she's ill-equipped to deal with his psychological issues. She's trying to start over and just needed help getting out of the hole. She came in because she could not, she was coming out of the mission, and she could not uh, sign up for utilities accounts in her new home without taking care of past due bills that were in her name and that I believe the boyfriend uh, ran up uh, while she was in the mission. And she wanted help kind of getting that stuff out of her past, the financial obligations out of her past, so that she could start life in this new home with her son. And this is not normal, but we actually had some email correspondence after this. And before Christmas, when I checked in with her, this is part of what she said. Thank you and the church so much. It has been so rough here lately. We missed the Christmas bureaus because we were at the mission, and then we can't even get food from the agencies because you can only get one box every 60 days. It's been hard to do really anything. This year is the year my son will know what the true meaning of Christmas is and not that it's about presents. It's going to be hard, but at least we have a roof over our head. I checked back in with her after Christmas, and she wrote this. We had a Christmas where my little guy was pretty disappointed and thought that he was bad because Santa didn't come. But we spent time as a family. He ended up in the mental hospital for his issues, but we are working on things. We are strong, and we will make it. And she didn't ask for any more help after that. Boy, I could have come away with a different impression of her if I didn't learn her story. If I didn't put the stones down first, if I didn't ask questions, I could have come away with a very different view. We read today the story of uh, Jesus and the woman caught in adultery. Uh, the woman came to, uh, well, the woman was caught in the act of adultery, and that leaves all kinds of things to the imagination. And they brought her in, were ready to stone her. They asked Jesus, what should we do to trap him? The law says we should stone her. What do you say? Jesus is riding in the ground. And then he says that famous quote, right? Let he who is without sin cast the first stone. It says they all went away. And that Jesus went up to the woman said, has no one condemned you? She says, no one. And he says, neither do I condemn you. And then finishes by saying, go and sin no more. Or go and leave your life of sin. Interesting scene, isn't it? You know, Jesus didn't say that adultery was okay. He didn't excuse the adultery. He told her, go and sin no more. 
leave your life of sin. But first, first, he looked at the crowd and said, put the stones down first. It's almost as if he looked at the crowd and said, what right do you have to hold those stones in your hand? I have to guess what got his goat a little bit was that they probably didn't know this woman, didn't know her story, didn't know her struggles, probably didn't even know her name. They wanted to throw stones first and ask questions later. And I have to guess that that was the problem Jesus had. Not that adultery was okay, but they wanted to throw stones first. There are many assumptions we make, even about stories in the Bible. A few chapters earlier, there's the story of Jesus with the woman at the well. You remember that one? And at some point uh, in the story, Jesus says, go get your husband. The woman says, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, yes, you're right. You have had five husbands, and the man you're living with now is not your husband. Now, Hundreds and hundreds of years of Bible studies and sermons and everything have assumed because of our context, where that doesn't often happen, that this woman is sinful and promiscuous and can't settle down with one man, right? We assume she has lived a life of sin. But wait a minute, where does it say that? Do you know how early some men died in those days? Her husbands could have died. Some of them could have unilaterally decided to divorce her. And how do we know that she's romantically or sexually involved with the man she's living with now? Women had to live with a man. Could have been her father. Could have been some other kind of benefactor. And then there's also some of the scholarship that says, well, she went to the well at at the wrong part of the day. Huh? Assumptions. There's nothing in there to indicate many of the things that we assume about this woman. But we have assumptions based on our experience. There's another interesting way that this has happened in the ways, uh, a way that we've learned to put down stones and learn how complicated things are when it comes to the issue of prostitution and human trafficking. You remember American Baptist women focused on this for some time? Uh, Had some speakers, took offerings, The uh, human trafficking conversation has made us realize that the prostitution scene is very, very complicated and that you have many women who started out very young and may not have even chosen to be there. We've learned through that that it's present right here in our country and right here in our state and not just overseas. And in a recent Christian Century article, they talked to a woman named Sarah who was the communications director of Traffic Free. And here's what she says about her own journey and learning about this. She said, I assumed prostitution was a profession that people go into by choice. It didn't cross my mind that people could be trapped or enslaved. We can't possibly know what's going on in their minds. They've been brainwashed into thinking they're loved, some of these women. The state of Illinois recently, I don't know how recently, I forget the date, was one of the states to decriminalize prostitution. They made it so that prostitution is not a felony in that state. Now on the surface we ask, well why would you do that? It's wrong. Punish people for doing wrong. Well through these conversations they've realized that even if a woman wants to get out of this life, How is she going to get a job with a felony on her record? It's not that they've said it's okay. It's just that we've found it's complicated when we put the stones down first. I think sometimes we uh, confuse an explanation with an excuse. There are some pundits and news personalities that do this for a living. You know, they get a guest on their show to talk about some kind of society problem, and as the guest tries to explain it, the host corners them in in trying to say that they're giving an excuse for whatever the thing is. But an explanation is different than an excuse. And sometimes when people try to put the stone down first and learn more, and at least get an explanation, 
they get accused of giving an excuse. The assumptions we make come out of our experience, but sometimes they're problematic. There's another big issue that we face that I wanted to mention today in our society where really, if you ask me, it's a prime example of the way that we throw stones first and ask questions later. It's the issue of immigration. Oh, come on, Corey, do you have to get controversial today? Right? Well, if we are going to have a faith that is relevant in today's world and the real issues that people face, we have to talk about real issues that affect real people. I'm not going to endorse anything. I'm not going to endorse anybody. I just have a couple of questions and observations from a Christian point of view. I think that's what you pay me for. I, you know. This is Sebastian de la Cruz. 11-year-old boy who sang the national anthem at a, a San Antonio Spurs game on June 11th, 2013. Dressed just like that. I believe that's called a mariachi, if I remember correctly, the, the traditional outfit there. Uh, he sang the national anthem at the beginning of that game, and that's a picture from it. He was dressed just like that. Well, uh, this is one of those situations where um, those of you who do not use the computer or the internet... Stay there. Because if you are active on the internet and websites like Twitter, uh, you saw that when he was singing the national anthem, the web lit up with comments like this. I'll bet you that little racial slur hopped the border just to sing the national anthem. Another one said, there's a little Mexican kid singing the national anthem. What has the world come to? Folks, these were not isolated comments. Hundreds and hundreds of tweets just like that came out of the stadium alone. Problem. Sebastian was born in San Antonio. He's never lived anywhere but America. He doesn't speak Spanish that well. And his father served in the Navy but they don't want him here. He's a citizen, always has been, hasn't known anything but America, but oh, we think we know who the immigrants are. By the way, one of the reasons this is relevant for us to talk about, in my view, is because we're part of the American Baptist Church's family, and I guarantee you there are a substantial number of undocumented immigrants that are members of American Baptist Churches in this country. But now Sebastian proved himself to be a better man than me at 11 years old. Because you know what I did? I threw stones at the stone throwers. I was mad. It's like those racist people. You know what Sebastian said? With those racist remarks, it was just people, how they were raised. My father and my mama told me you should never judge people by how they look. proved himself to be a better man than me. Because just like Jesus, he said, neither do I condemn you. But we think we know. I want to play a little game with you that I totally stole from somebody. Okay? I didn't make this up. Let's play Spot the Immigrant. <laughs> Selena Gomez or Justin Bieber? Bieber. Justin Bieber is the immigrant. He's, on, he's here on an O-1 visa, which is what you get when you're talented. Talented. He has at least two felonies. They're not going to deport him. He's talented. Spot the immigrants. Geraldo Rivera or Ted Koppel? Ted Koppel. Geraldo Rivera, you know, looks kind of Latino, has a Latino name. Ted Koppel, or Geraldo Rivera was born in Brooklyn. Ted Koppel was born in the UK and spent 10 years here not being a citizen from 1953 to 1963. 
You know, all I tried to do in thinking about this was put myself in another's shoes. Show of hands. How many of you have been to the USCIS website to read about what you have to do to immigrate here legally? A few of you. And you're probably going to tell me I missed something later, you know, those of you who have read it. From what I can gather, now first of all, let me give you a couple screenshots. I went to one website that talks about it. This is just one of a hundred pages that give you the lowdown and everything you have to do to immigrate here legally. Because part of what reasonable people say is, I don't have a problem with folks wanting to come here, but at least come here legally. But then I looked into what that takes. You have a chance if you have a family member who's a citizen, if you have someone who's willing to hire you, and pay upwards of $8,000 in legal fees to have you as their employee, or if you have a refugee status. Those are the main three as I understand it. There's also provisions for military and a Violence Against Women Act and, and that kind of thing. But you can have a better chance of getting a green card or a visa, immigrate here legally if you have those things going for you. Relative, work, employer, or refugee status. You know, I don't know about you, but I can't take credit for where I was born. You know, I was born in America. That's advantage number one right out of the gate. I was born white. That's advantage number two right out of the gate. I was born to a middle class family who could afford my education and health care. That's number three right out of the gate and I happen to be born to a Christian family. Now, I could be wrong, but I don't remember asking for any of that, is what biologists call the accident of birth. But here I am, can I take credit for any of that? Now, those are, you can come here legally uh, if you uh, meet those criteria. You have a very small chance otherwise if you're just applying and it takes a very long time with a lot of fees and complicated instructions. And then is the question of citizenship. And just so you know, I wanted to read this part. In order to qualify for U.S. citizenship, an individual must have had a green card status for at least five years or three years if he obtained his green card through a U.S. citizen spouse or through the Violence Against Women Act. There are other exceptions for members of the U.S. military who serve in time of war. Applicants for U.S. citizenship must be at least 18 years old, demonstrate continuous residency, demonstrate good moral character, pass English and U.S. history and civics exams, and pay an application fee. That's if you manage to get here in the first place. Now, I just have a question. Pass U.S. history and civics exams. Do you know how many natural-born citizens can't do that? Do you know how many members of Congress can't do that? I came to a different place when I put the stone down first. Let me, let me just give you where I came down. I imagined myself in another country where we're very poor, living with my wife. Our family has been in poverty for generations. Very poor country, uh, haven't been able to get ahead, and we find out we're pregnant. And I believe, in this hypothetical situation, I believe that the only way my child is going to have a better chance at life is for my wife and I to come here and have the baby here so that the child is a citizen. Now that happens all the time, right? Illegal? Yep. Drain on our resources? Yep. Would I do it? Probably. Now, you know, you can condemn me for that, and maybe that's not where you come down, but I tried to imagine myself in that situation. I would take a bullet for my family, wouldn't you? And I pictured myself in that situation, and I said, you know, if I believed that was my child's only chance at a better life, would I risk it? Probably. Maybe that makes me foolish. Illegal? Yep. 
drain on our resources, yep. But I'd probably do it if it were me. That's what happened when I put the stones down first. Jesus didn't say it wasn't wrong. He said, you have to put the stone down first. Here's what the late Henry Nouwen said. Compassion grows with the inner recognition that your neighbor shares your humanity with you. This partnership cuts through all walls which might have kept you separate. Across all barriers of land and language, wealth and poverty, knowledge and ignorance, we are one, created from the same dust, subject to the same laws, destined for the same end. Remember what Jesus said? Blessed are, as some examples from the passage, those who mourn, the meek, the merciful, the peacemakers. You know, part of what he's kind of saying is that you might not want to find yourself on the other side. You know, he's kind of saying if you make God choose sides, these are the sides he's going to choose. Paul said God shows the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God shows the weak things of the world to shame the strong. And of course, the other passage I could have used is Matthew 7. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Whenever I stop and think about the ways I've judged others and whether or not I want the same measure to be used on me, I say, oops, no thanks, please don't do that. I am feeling a little sheepish because I am horrible at this. I throw stones first. I'm very bad at that. You can ask my wife. You can read my blog or Facebook page. Who knows? So while I'm confessing to you, and since it's Super Bowl Sunday, I have one more example. Oh, wait a minute, sorry. You know Richard Sherman? We do now, right? After the Seattle Seahawks clinched the title, he had this uh, now famous interview with Aaron Andrews, is that right, Joe? Thank you. Uh, And he did this interview where he was, you know, talking trash on Crabtree, guy on the other team, uh, and saying he was the best and all of this. You know what I did? I picked up my stone. I threw stones. How unsportsmanlike. What a prideful guy, I said. Now, was it unsportsmanlike? Yeah, if you ask me. Was it prideful? Yeah. But one of my seminary classmates sent me something that made me put my stones down. Do you know anything about Richard Sherman? He grew up in Compton, California. Very, very, as I understand it, very poor town or city. Uh, very substandard school system. I think the graduate, high school graduation rate is about 57%. Sherman graduated from that school system with a 4.2 GPA. He went to Stanford, played ball for Stanford. He has set up his own nonprofit. Sherman Family Foundation or something like that. And according to what I read, the guy has never been arrested in his life. Oh, I threw my stone first. It's not that it wasn't unsportsmanlike. It's just that whenever I have my moments, they don't happen to be on TV. Lucky me. Putting our stones down first. It's what I'm learning to do. It's what Jesus told that crowd to do. But I might still root for the Broncos.